I'm so happy to be here. Like Melissa said, I'm a reproductive psychiatrist. And what does that mean? That means that I actually focus on the mental health and the emotional well-being of all patients as they go through preconception, pregnancy, delivery, postpartum, and early parenting. And I also spent a great deal of time doing medical education and training. But one of the reasons why I was so psyched to be here today is because a lot of my experiences at Wesleyan actually have really shaped my trajectory all throughout, med all throughout medicine. So I'm just going to start off by thinking about the Hippocratic Oath, right? There I am, graduating from medical school, and we all have to take the Hippocratic Oath. When you take the Hippocratic Oath in its original form, you're actually swearing by Apollo, the god of medicine. But actually, if you think about it, what about childbirth? Apollo, I had to actually look this up, but <laughs> Apollo actually had a twin sister, Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, who has seen the Hunger Games, right? Katniss Everdeen, right? The goddess of the hunt. And it was actually Artemis who was the goddess of childbirth. Their mom, Leto, is the goddess of fertility. Her mother is Phoebe, who is a titan and associated with the moon. And her mother was Gaia, who represents Earth and is thought to be the mother of all ancestral life. So an enormous amount of power there, right? That's actually not anywhere in the Hippocratic Oath. But what I would say is that it's actually been kind of the synergy and the tension sometimes between Artemis and Apollo and what they represent that's really shaped my entire career in medicine. So to start out, how did I even become a doctor at all? It actually happened here. So I got to Wesleyan, and I was like, of course, I'm going to be a dance major. I spent, <laughs> I spent an enormous amount of time in the Center for the Arts in this very building and really thought, like, of course I'm going to be a dance major. I danced my whole entire life. I love Susan Laurie, who I think is still teaching here. Um, and th I thought it was just super easy. Um, and I didn't have to make any further decision until I just randomly took a class called the Physics of the Living Cell. I don't even know if they teach that anymore. But essentially what that was was talking about how if you understand a little bit about the laws of physics, you can really understand how cells work. And I thought to myself, oh my god, that is so cool. How come I never knew that? And just learning about how the pieces of the cells fit together and how the laws of physics really govern physiology. And I was like, you know what? That is it. I am changing my major. I'm going to be a biology major. And I'm going to be pre-med. And that's all there is to it. So <laughs> that's what I decided at the time. And fast forward, I graduate from Wesleyan. I moved to San Francisco. I actually spent the next six years dancing, um, so didn't even go to medical school right away at all. And when I finally said to my friends, OK, I am ready. I'm going to go to medical school. Here I go. All my friends who are like yoga teachers and Pilates instructors and screenwriters, they were all like, uh, are you really sure you want to do this? <laughs> and I was like, how bad could it be? This is going to be fun. And <laughs> I don't know if you ever saw those videos that's like of the hydraulic press, pressing things and crushing them. <laughs> so there's these videos online. It's like a 100 ton hydraulic press. And all the videos about is you just watch the descent of the press, and then there's like a little gummy bear at the end, and it just like presses the gummy bear until the gummy bear is like completely flat. That's what it was essentially like. <laughs> but it wasn't that bad because it was actually only for about 10 years or so. <laughs> no, actually, I truly loved it. But um, one of the uh, dilemmas that I really had, even as I entered medicine at all, was you know, how can I keep creativity alive? Can I keep creativity alive as I go through medicine and medical school, residency training, fellowship? Can I do that? So what I would often do is think about my grandmother, who was one of my personal heroes. 
She uh, was an immigrant from the Ukraine and came through Ellis Island. She was also a dancer in her early life, a modern dancer. And then she went on, she became a mother, she had my dad and his two brothers. And then uh, after that, she finally had a chance to go to college at the age of 72. So she took herself to college, first generation, and uh, she majored in dance. And then she actually became a dance teacher for the rest of her life when she died uh, at 82. And, but she said to her dance teacher, right around the time she was having kids, she said to her dance teacher, you know, how am I actually going to still be a creative person? Because now I'm taking all this time off, I'm having kids, I, you know, I'm not even being an artist anymore. And her dance teacher turned to her and said, don't you understand that becoming a parent and growing a new life in front of you and inside you is actually one of the most creative acts you can ever do? And her teacher was actually Martha Graham who was the mother of all modern dance, right? And so one of my favorite quotes is actually from Martha Graham. There's a vitality, a life force, and a quickening that's translated through you into action. And because there's only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. One of the things I love about this quote is that actually in medicine, we refer to quickening as when someone is pregnant and they can actually feel the baby move. It's actually a medical term. It's right around week 18 or so. So I love this quote. And as I went through all of medical training and residency, as I was, you know, learning how to deliver a baby and being in the neonatal ICU with parents and thinking about how best to treat postpartum depression and how to really sort of provide the best mental health care I could for my patients, it actually wasn't that hard to try and keep creativity alive because all I started to hear were stories over and over and over again. So there was a story about hope. Here's a patient who has six miscarriages and then she has a full-term stillbirth. And then she goes on to deliver a healthy full-term infant. Here's a story about resilience. A woman who had a mother who died of a drug overdose and a father who was very abusive towards her. She grows up, she starts to have children, and she gets the chance to become the parent that she never had. There's a story of independence. A 40-year-old woman who says, you know what, there's a lot of societal pressure to have children, and in my heart of hearts, I don't want to be a mother. And her ability to make that dignified decision for herself. And there's a lot of stories about love. So here's a 40-year-old man who's dying of stage four cancer, a father of two sons, who at the very end of his life, after he's getting some of his last chemo treatments, he puts on a surgical mask, gets into his car and drives to the edge of the soccer field where his kids are playing and watches from the parking lot and sees the last game of the season. So, and actually what was kind of cool too is that there's all sorts of stories like that because everybody who becomes a parent changes, that there's an inherent narrative arc to it. Um, I'm part of a team that's putting together the first digital platform, uh, thinking about the experience of pregnancy and postpartum. And as part of our initial work, we were like, okay, let's just ask random people on an anonymous parenting listserv um, how they think they changed through pregnancy and becoming a parent. And it was fascinating because half the group said things like, I felt more confident. I felt strong within myself. I felt like I could take on even more challenges once I had done this. And the other half of the group said, I'm lost. My sense of self is destroyed. I actually don't know how I'm going to get myself back. So you hear these stories about people changing, and then I thought to myself, well, 
if this is such a process of change, what else is changing? So there's a group in Spain, uh, a researcher named Hoxima, and in 2016, she published an amazing study that showed that pregnancy itself actually profoundly changes the brain. And it changes it in this area that's called sort of the theory of mind or social cognition. It's the ability of one person to understand the feelings and thoughts of another person. And it's thought to be re really helps a parent understand the needs of an infant. So there's a lot of story no matter where you look. But one of the other things that's kind of weird when you think about it is here we are gathering all this really fundamental information, and that's wonderful, but it's 2018. <laughs> Why has it taken so long for us to really gather some of these fundamentals? And that's where we understand that, of course, and we know from, in Wesleyan, this taught us a lot about this, is that health and science and medicine is always embedded in a social context that there is an ecosystem, and it's a social ecosystem, that people don't just get pregnant in a vacuum, right? They are pregnant and deliver and become a parent in an ecosystem of themselves and of their relationships, of their community, of their physical environment, of societal forces that really um, shape and sometimes put pressure on that ecosystem. So one of my colleagues from Columbia, this wonderful researcher named Catherine Monk, she was doing work looking at the role of stress and how it impacts pregnancy. And one of the things that they discovered was actually the amount of perceived stress that a pregnant patient feels actually is influencing the genetic environment of the placenta. It actually turns on and turns off genes that are responsible for regulating stress hormones inside the uterus. Which is like kind of amazing, right? There's like an inside-outside phenomenon going on. And I always like that story, too, because the placenta is sometimes referred to as the tree of life. So it's the tree of life because there are all these blood vessels that sort of extend out into branching vessels and end in trees in, inside the placenta itself. If you actually look at a photograph of a placenta, it looks just like a tree. And I really like that idea because, of course, trees also need an ecosystem. And you can't have a tree just sort of living by itself, right? And just take a look at all the elements of this ecosystem. You're really reminded that, you know, trees need sunlight. And they need a safe environment. They need nourishing soil. And they need to have roots that can actually draw from a clean water supply. And that you can't actually separate what's going on with someone individually from the rest of the system that it's occurring in. So, and the other aspect of that is that it's actually even affected, to be honest, my own life in medicine. So there's uh, the American Academy of um, Medical Colleges, the American Association of Medical Colleges has been doing a lot of work looking at what it's like to go through medical training and reach leadership positions, and what are the gender differences in there. And part of what has, they've discovered is that there's an enormous disconnect. So actually, women and men enter medical school now, thankfully, in roughly equal numbers. But by the time they get to leadership positions, there's an enormous gap. And that gap is shown up in the fact that only about 20% of full professors are women in medicine. Only about 15% of all medical student deans are women. Only about 15% of all chairs of departments are women. So it kind of makes it, it makes me feel kind of daunted when I think about, you know, trying to be in the room where it happens, so to speak. <laughs> that was a Wesleyan person who said that, right? <laughs> and I know that whole album. Uh, and um, it, it's daunting 
to actually come into a system where there's so much stacked against your ability to thrive. But that's okay, <laughs> it really is, because the last point that I would bring up about this is that this has actually been one of the most creative things I've ever been involved in. And, if you, and while we're waiting to sort of make more room at the table, you can actually make your own space. So this curriculum that we're working on, which is the first reproductive psychiatry curriculum in the entire United States, it's happening right now. So this is the website. This is not a live website. <laughs> You're seeing a working draft of the website. See where it says NCRP, so the National Curriculum of Reproductive Psychiatry? That's actually a placeholder because we don't even have a logo. Like, <laughs> this is still being put together. And we're creating this field as we're going along. And it's tiny. But what's been so cool about it is that because there's so much interest in this area, we started doing this curriculum in about 2015, and there were just a few people involved. And it's now a collaboration of 30 institutions across the country. So it, I just find myself so grateful a lot of the time getting the chance to work on something that's truly from the ground up and one of the most creative things I've ever had the privilege of being part of. So part of what I think about when I think about some of the challenges and some of the strain and some of the difficulties of being in medicine, I think to myself, wait a minute, you can find your own voice you can keep creativity alive. You can understand that it's okay to think about medicine in a societal context, and that you can actually make your own space. And those are the ideas that I really think about that really inform me every day as I draw upon the power of both Artemis and Apollo. <laughs>